So I'm going to introduce myself. Um, my name is Mark Richardo. Uh, I, I am an assistant professor in the health science department. <laughs> I teach a uh, first aid and CPR course in that department, um, along with uh, some other things. I teach an epidemiology course. I teach an aging course. Um, I teach a public health law course. A bunch of different uh, courses in the uh, Health Science Department. I'm just going to have the two um, over here introduce themselves as well. They'll be um, jumping in at certain points during the presentation as well. Hi, my name is Wendy Shu. I'm the Director of Student Health Services. So for your information, we do have a, a full-service medical clinic, pharmacy, laboratory, and health education services on campus. So yes, as Mark sort of talks about different scenarios, it's possible there could be places that Student Health Services could help also. I'm Aaron Mumford, Supervisor with Security. I coordinate medical response that security has with the department. Um, with security, we are, most people that would be responding to any kind of medical situations that you would be having would be at least a uh, emergency uh, EMR. Um, we also do employ um, EMTs like myself as well that can also respond to any kind of incident. I'm Chandler, I'm the university's Director of Environmental Health Safety and Risk Management. I can't tell every group. When you figure out what that is, let me know because it changes from hour to hour. But like Mark said, we do this, we try to do this every year, sometimes even every semester. It works best when you guys ask questions because we don't know specific questions that are in your head. We've got some general ideas of these things that we see happen, but at any point, something like, hey, what about something like this? We'll do our best to get Mark to answer it or one of these guys to answer it. So, yeah. We've got four, well, three really good resources in me in the room. So I mean, at least we should be able to answer your questions and and, and get hopefully an answer for you that uh, will at least you know help with what it is that you uh, you want to know. All right. So as I said, on your handout there, we'll match up what is up here. All right. What I like to refer to as the golden rule: do no further harm. If you can't make it better by doing something yourself, then 911 or Whatever other resources are available is your best method, okay? You don't want to make it worse. You don't want to put yourself at risk, but you also don't want to make things any worse for the victim or for you know, what is it, whatever has already happened, okay? So I, I start out with this exact same slide, first day of the first aid class I teach. It's the first thing we talk about before moving into the idea of assessing the scene, getting an idea of what is going on. Okay, in all of these situations, we are concerned with your safety first, okay? This is not hero training, all right? I don't need more victims. There's no way that the 30 people or whatever we have in this room all rushing in and, and turning into victims is going to help me. That, that does not help me, okay? The more people that are safe, the more people that can evaluate the scene, can access, as, you, as you're looking up here, prioritize care, doing those things, the better off your victim victims are going to be. So if you notice here, the idea of evaluating, assessing safety, all of those before you even move in. So an example, you, you come in through the hallway here, you look through the door, you see someone is down. You want to evaluate what's going on before you rush in, right? You don't want to just come running in and decide what's going on and then there's something, you know, something is wrong in the room and you've now put yourself at risk. So look in before you decide to do anything, all right? Assess that scene. Um, assess safety, we'll get into the care things um, later. Medical alert tags. What might a medical alert tag tell you? If somebody's wearing a medical alert tag or a bracelet or necklace, what might that tell you? Okay, an allergy. What else? If they're diabetic. Okay, diabetic's another one. A couple more, what else? Epileptic. Okay, epileptic, it might be ep epilepsy or another seizure disorder, that's another one. Okay, so just some general ideas of some things that that might show. Then a head to toe check. Um, depending on who you who you talk to, some will talk about a little more of a physical, um, actual hands on head to toe. I usually refer to it as you can do most of it visually and verbally. You can ask some questions when you get to that next, and then you can just kind of visualize the head to toe. You might have to do a little bit of palpation, so to speak, but mainly just visualize. All right, from what we talked about in the past, I added what we refer to as a 
sample history or a victim interview. All right, if you go in for a medical appointment, these are the same questions that the doctor would ask you or the nurse would ask you, or a lot of cases, both. Signs and symptoms, why are you here? Okay, so in the case of a, of a situation where someone you know, is, is injured or they're still able to talk to you, they may say, you know, I feel faint or I, I fainted or I think I passed out. That's the signs and symptoms. And then you can just kind of work down allergies, medications. You may not get to all of this. You may not even do it in this order, but the idea is, is that they love mnemonics. First aid loves mnemonics. There, there, there is probably 15, 20 of these throughout the, the, the first aid course. And these are just ways to help you remember things. Obviously memory devices, and this is the memory device um, for the actual victim interview or sample history. Okay, questions thus far? All right, this is what we already talked about, just a further um, illustration, further uh, driving the point home. Again, your safety and the idea of not needing um, or wanting more victims. Okay, next thing we're gonna talk about is the idea of deciding to take action. So usually what we talk about is you notice there's something wrong. You recognize an emergency exists, and then the next step is you decide to take action, and usually what that action is is to call 911 or activate someone that is more qualified than you. Okay? That's the general steps. That keeps you safe. It also gets help, activates EMS, and gets more advanced um, people involved. So this is the idea of the Good Samaritan Law. Who knows as a general rule what the Good Samaritan Law is? How does it work? It's basically, like if you're trying to help someone and you have good intentions, you can't really get in trouble for that. Okay. Yeah, it's the idea of where if you provide care um, at your level of training or what they refer to as what a reasonable and or prudent person would do, and something goes wrong, the Good Samaritan law covers you. Okay. Now, there's a couple of things that need to be added in here. The Good Samaritan Law does not cover you if you start moving victims who should not be moved. So if someone has a head, neck, or back injury, you move them, that head, neck, or back injury gets worse, the Good Samaritan Law does not cover you, okay? As far as the Good Samaritan Law is concerned, there are three reasons you get to move someone. One is a scene safety issue. Two is in order to provide proper assistance, so you can roll someone over, things like that. And then the third one is to get to someone more injured, okay? Other than that, that's the one area the Good Samaritan Law does not really come, is if you move someone um, and something goes wrong. You do CPR, a rib happens to break, or you have some rib damage, that's covered if you're doing CPR properly, okay? So there's a couple of things there. The other thing that's very, very important with the Good Samaritan Law is the idea of obtaining consent. On a college campus, we are dealing with adults. In almost all instances, they are 18 years plus, which means they have the right to consent to or refuse our care. So in order to allow yourself to provide care if they are conscious, you need to obtain consent. The way we want to do that is what we refer to as informed consent. We introduce ourselves. In my case, hi, my name is Mark. I'm a trained first responder. My level of training, can I help you? You say yes, you say no, shake head, nod head, whatever it is. Even if you tell me no, you don't want me to assist you, I can still talk to you. That doesn't, unless you tell me to, you know, not to do that, but legally I can still talk to you. If you say no, I can't lay my hands on you, but I can still talk to you, I can still call 911, okay? After that, I tell you what I plan to do. I I'm sorry, I tell you what I think is wrong, and then I tell you what I plan to do. So it looks like you may have uh, fallen and hit your head. You may have a little bit of uh, blood loss there. You may be a little bit faint. I'm gonna do some bleeding control. I'm going to put you in a position to prevent shock. Is that okay? And then I follow up with that, all right? I'm allowed to do that if you tell me I'm allowed to do that based on consent. Okay. What if they're unconscious? What do I do then? They can't tell me, if they can't tell me that I can help them, can I help them or not? Yes. It's implied or assumed 
that since it's a life-threatening condition, they would want your help. All right? Okay, let's try this. What if I have a victim who is choking? We're not going to get into this in any more detail than this for right now, but they're choking. They're past the point where they can talk to me, but they're grabbing their throat and they're, they're not able to get air. I ask them if they want my assistance. They shake their head no. If that person goes unconscious, can I help them? They can't because it's now become life-threatening, even though when they were conscious and it was technically not life-threatening, they did not want my assistance. Somebody that is unconscious, it is assumed or implied they would want your assistance. All right? Make sense? Okay. 911 emergency. All right. This is where I'm going to tie in air in here. All right. Now, 911 first, campus security first. What is your preference? Doesn't matter. Either or. Um, it, um, usually, typically, if it's a smaller incident, uh, just call us so we're not tying up other resources around the city. Right. But if it's a bigger incident, more life threat, life or limb type situation, by all means call 911. We're going to beat them here anyway. Um, the ambulance does not take a while. And uh, most of security has more medical training than the police do here in Mankato. So we're going to be able to help more medically than the police will. So it'll be us first, police, and then the ambulance next, most likely, unless fire decides to take them on that day. But, sure. um, you can call 911. We'll still get here first. We'll hear it. They'll, they let us know whatever's happening on our campus. Plus, all of our ways are tied into a scanner so we can hear anything on our campus anyway. Okay. So, either or. Okay. So there's the, the idea on that. And I always like to get that clarified because I, I've heard some different things over the years depending. And so that's the uh, that's the official, um, you know, what we'll go with, you know, at, at this point is, uh, again, either one, if it's a life-threatening, something that is going to be life or limb, as you mentioned, where it's potentially a life or death situation than 911. Otherwise, um, some of those could be a uh, security um, issue at, at that point. So, so I just let, listed a few things up here that potentially are 911 emergencies. This is not an all-inclusive list by any stretch of the imagination. What I usually recommend is if you are unsure, call 911. It's better to have them and not need them than to need them and not have them. Okay. And again, they're not, you're not going to get in any kind of trouble or anything like that if it's something you legitimately need or you legitimately believe needs 911. So there's some examples there. And then just some other things here, obviously the chest pain. Um, there's that fainting or loss of consciousness, uh, mental status changing or changes, breathing difficulties, um, some of those things. Okay, questions thus far? All right. I'm going to get into some specific illnesses and injuries now. Some of these are more significant than others, at least as far as life-threatening um, conditions. But these are some of the ones we've talked about before. So I'm going to start with fainting. Okay? This one is not normally life-threatening. But this one, of all the ones you're going to see, this is probably as common as anything else. Somebody sees, you know, they faint the sight of blood, or there's something on a on a video, or something in a in a lab session, whatever it is that causes them to become queasy, which may cause them to faint. Maybe they didn't. Uh, maybe they didn't eat. Maybe they didn't. Maybe they're a little dehydrated, tied in. So maybe it's a little bit warm in the, uh, the the lab setting. Whatever it is, of the ones I've seen, this is probably the most common one, other than maybe the the seizure which sometimes leads to this or they, they tie in together okay so again brief loss of consciousness usually in fainting if you get them in a position where the head is lower than the rest of the body the head is lower than the heart it clears itself up pretty quickly if they feel faint have them sit down lie down or what they used to refer to as the crash position head lower than the between the knees or head lower than the heart the blood will re will uh, fill up the, uh, the brain and usually the problem pretty much on its own um, goes away. So some of the signs and symptoms, I mentioned some of these already, there's that visual blurring, sweating, the nausea. And again, with fainting, usually the person that is about to faint is gonna notice it long before anybody else. They start to feel a little bit lightheaded. They might have that double vision. Again, get them to sit down, get them to lie down. Right here. Lie down, sit down, loosening that restrictive clothing. 
something to, a lot of times some water will help, um, fanning them, anything you can do to try to, again, make them more comfortable, uh, take away the uh, anxiety, the stress that they're likely feeling, um, usually is a pretty good place to start. Right. And then some of the other ones, I mentioned some of these already. A lot of times, a little bit of fresh air, a cool rag on the face. Obviously, we're not gonna you know, slap their face, we're not gonna pour water over them. You know, we, we don't need to make it worse by doing something like that. Um, no smelling salts, no ammonia, anything like that. You don't want them to start shaking and, and causing more damage in case they did some damage on the fall. Fainting, the injury, the concern with the injury is when they fall. There's no way to catch yourself, you crumble to the ground, you can hit your head, you can break um, legs, arms, things like that when you, when you fall, that's the concern. So notice here, these are not always medical emergencies. If it happens multiple times, we need to find out why. That could be some kind of a blood clot, could be an aneurysm, could be you know some other issues. But normally they regain conscious very quickly if that becomes an issue. Also, you're more likely to faint seated than standing. So if you get them seated, usually that will take care of the problem. You're about to get bad news, maybe you should sit down for this. It's one of the reasons why you're less likely to faint. I don't want you to go down when you're you get that bad news, that you know, sudden uh, traumatic event or that sudden traumatic news that might cause you to, to faint. If you're seated, it's less likely to happen. Okay. Over 40, pregnant, and then some other things. Okay, questions on fainting? Yes? So, if I just give a scenario, let's say I have somebody in an anatomy lab, and they are about to faint, we, we get them down to the floor, um, maybe they don't ever grow out, but they really start sweating and are uncomfortable. And if we just get them water and they seem to recover, we don't need to notify security at all? Normally not. That's normally not a medical. Would you, would you agree with that? Or would you have them call anyway? I would have them call security anyway. There might be an underlying medical issue as well. Plus, we also like to document okay. every kind of medical that happened on campus. We are the campus's uh, um, report writing entity, so we like to record all kinds of incidents that happen around campus. Right. So as far as the, the medical emergency piece, it's probably not quite so much, but just for documentation purposes at least then doing that. So good question. Anything else on that? All right. The next one we're going to talk about is seizures. And again, this is another one that you see um, quite a bit. So there's two separate steps. The first one is while the seizure is occurring. This one's tricky because there's very little you can do when the seizure is going on. The two main things, you do not want to restrain them and you do not want to put anything in their mouths while they're seizing. They used to teach that, they've gone away from it, especially the mouth thing, they no longer teach that. So don't hold them down, don't put anything in their mouth. In a setting where you can, you'd like to get as much stuff that is dangerous out of the way for them in case they start rolling into something or flailing their arms and knocking something down, you'd like to um, remove those things. So give them a space as much as you can to have the seizure. Sometimes you might put something under their, under their head, things like that, but otherwise, for the most part, allow the seizure to occur. Once it's over, I'll get to the 911 here, 911 piece here in just a second. Once it's over, it's all about airway and levels of consciousness. Just once they come out of it, asking them some basic questions. Do you know where you're at? Do you know your name? You know, things that you would know the answer to and they should know the answer to. Remember, when they first come out of it, they're probably not gonna be completely lucid. That's, that's normal. But as it goes along, they should start to regain that level, that level of consciousness. They should be back to that alert area where they're able to answer those questions fairly rapidly. All right, also stay with them um, until they become aware of those surroundings. Again, here, same idea. Even if it's not technically a 911 emergency, security um, as, a, as a fallback, uh, again, so it can be documented. And then in these situations, these are um, 911 uh, situations in a seizure. Um, incident, okay? Usually with a seizure, if they have a known seizure disorder, 
and they start to seize is usually when they talk about it not always being a 911 emergency, because in a lot of instances that's a medication adjustment, and they usually don't need an ambulance ride to get medications adjusted, okay? But if it's any of these other ones, and again, you're, you may not know, it's very likely you're not gonna know that 911 or security would be your, your first call. All right, questions there? Just as a reference here to notice this five minutes, most of the time with a seizure, from beginning to end, it should be no more than five minutes. In other words, by the end of five minutes, they should be back to a fairly lucid state if it's a, a traditional normal seizure, all right? I'm not saying you're necessarily gonna sit there and stop watching time it, because obviously that's not concern number one, but as a general rule, that five minute time frame is about what you're, about what you're looking at. All right, questions there? All right. Next one is the insulin reaction or insulin shock. This is the traditional uh, medical emergency dealing with insulin. So this is the one that is also known as hypoglycemia or abnormally low blood glucose. This is usually the individual who has diabetes and for whatever reason that day there, which is usually a very regimented schedule, has gotten off kilter somehow. Maybe a class went long or a meeting went long or whatever it was. They didn't eat before they went for whatever reason and now they're getting a little lightheaded. Um, they're starting to get uh, confused. They're starting to uh, become a little bit moody, some pale skin. Usually with this one, give them something that contains sugar and normally they will start to feel much better very quickly. You just need to make sure it actually has sugar in it. Diet soda's not gonna work, there's no sugar in that. Obviously plain water's not gonna work, there's no sugar in that. Okay? Maybe they carry something, maybe they have a, a candy bar or if they're fully conscious, you know, a piece of uh, hard candy or some kind of a, um, Sugar gel, or sugar gel or glucose or something like that. But whatever it is, um, otherwise orange juice, apple juice, uh, fruit juice, even milk to some extent works. Milk's not ideal, but there is enough sugar in milk to at least start the, uh, the, the process of, of making them feel better. So anything you can find that does contain sugar should help and make them feel better. All right, questions there? Again, with this one, if they come out of it, they probably do not need a 911 um, call. Uh, again, this should be a pretty quick uh, recovery um, if the sugar starts to, if you can find sugar and it starts to take hold um, uh, quickly or immediately, like it usually will. All right. Moving into a little bit on bleeding control. This is one where they have greatly reduced the number of steps. There used to be a lot more steps in bleeding control, at least at the basic level. What they are now teaching you is basically direct pressure, fingertip pressure first, then if that doesn't work, then taking the full hand, obviously with gloves and, and gauze and things like that, and then the full hand, if that does not work, and then if it is available after that, if those things do not work, taking some kind of a roller gauze and around and around and tying it off. All right, that should take care of the bleeding in most instances. If that does not work, um, obviously bleeding is something where if it is significant bleeding, arterial bleeding, you've got blood that is pumping from a wound, that is a medical emergency. You will need to get um, much, you know, further assistance, 911. Otherwise, if it is available, um, they do teach uh, tourniquets. You might likely are not going to have one uh, potentially available, but that is something that they have gone back to, to uh, teaching again. So just to show you then, there is the glove hand, the fingertips. And then that pressure dress. Okay. And then just using the bandage to secure the dressings in place, tie it off, and like I said, that should almost immediately stop that bleeding in most instances. Also, you will want to treat for shock, and again, that's that idea of lowering them to the ground, 
um, trying to get blood back to the core body. Okay, they start bleeding, they lose blood too rapidly, blood goes away from that core body, and more significant issues can occur. Okay. Any questions on bleeding control? Okay. Real basic, oh, I forgot one other thing here on, on the bleeding. Notice if we do have open fractures or embedded objects, we'll get to embedded objects here in just a second, you don't want to press directly over the wound site. You obviously don't want to put you know, a, a hand right directly over an open fracture. You've got you know, bone that is protruding from the, the, the skin. We don't want to push directly on top of that. So you have to work around that um, direct pressure around the area, not over the actual open wound site. Then moving on to the nosebleeds here. Okay, nosebleeds. The idea is the person is sitting upright. They no longer teach the idea of the head back. If you tilt the head back, blood goes down the throat. They swallow it. It gets into the stomach. It irritates the stomach. It causes them to vomit. It also causes more panic. Okay, because now not only do they have a nosebleed, it looks like they're vomiting blood, and it makes situ the situation that much worse. All right, head slightly forward or basically sitting up straight. You can pinch the nostrils together. If you have ice, apply a little bit of ice to the nose oftentimes will work. Do not put anything into the nostrils. Usually the terminology is don't put anything into the nostrils that you can't get out of the nostrils. All right, so as a, as a general rule, we don't, we, we don't shove things into the nostrils because sometimes it gets stuck and you can't get it out and you've got to go get that removed and that just adds another step to it. All right. Usually, nosebleeds are not medical emergencies. It looks a lot worse than it actually is. There's very little blood loss that is actually occurring. It just is such a visual um, injury that they see the blood. Usually, people around them start to panic and, and get nervous as well. If you can keep everyone calm, you can calm down your victim. Again, have them sit down. Uh, normally, that will um, take care of it pretty quickly. If you notice things like uh, what appears to be like clear fluids, um, almost like a uh, mucus type fluid coming out of the nostrils, that is potentially cerebral spinal fluid. We do not want to plug that. What, can, what that can do is it can build up pressure in the brain and cause more damage. So if you suspect skull fractures, things like that, you can put some gauze underneath so it doesn't run out of the clothing, but you don't really want to block the nostrils in that case because it can build up pressure and cause more damage. Okay. Nosebleeds, anything there? All right. Last thing in this area deals with the impaled or embedded object. Notice the first two points there are when you're allowed to remove an impaling, an, impale, an impaling object, keep in mind that this is not, we're not talking about like a little, you know, splinter in the finger or a little piece of glass in the finger, things like that. We're talking about larger items that are embedded. Those are what we don't want to remove. They can cause more significant bleeding. They can cause further damage to tissue, further nerve damage. So those items would need to stay in place. When they get to the medical facility, they will figure out how to remove those items. All right, secure it manually. Obviously trying to control bleeding, treating for shock, things go along with that. So something breaks, they get a, a fairly significant shard of glass in the arm again, you would not want to remove that. Um, you pack around it and support it. Okay. Questions there? Added a little bit in on burns. I'm going to start with a little bit on thermal burns. So thermal burns would be things like uh, steam, uh, hot water, those types of things are classic thermal burns. It's a pretty basic uh, tear steps. You need to stop the burning. Obviously you're sizing up the seam, so you remove them from the burn source. Stop the burning. You cool the burn. You cover the burn you treat for shock. Right. What do I put on the burn? 
what kind of things should I put on burns? Let's go find some cream or lotion from a cabinet somewhere and start slathering on there. Is that a good idea? No. As a general rule on burns, cold water, not ice, but cold water, tap water's fine, things like that. Nothing else should go on a burn unless it is specifically prescribed by a doctor or recommended by a pharmacist. You don't want to start putting a lot of other things on a burn. Now, if you have a small, you get a small burn on like one of the, on one finger or something that's a very small area of the body, it's not going to really matter much what you do because it's such a small area of the body that you're not going to do any further damage. But if you have burns over a significant portion of the body, we don't want to be adding a lot of extra um, materials to it. Again, cool the burning, or stop the burning, cool the burn, cover it. If it's open blisters, dry dressing. If it's closed skin, you can use a wet dressing. And then uh, again, if needed, treat for shock. And if it's significant enough, um, that would also be a 911 uh, emergency. Okay, questions there? All right. Next one is chemical burns. Notice bullet point two, bullet point three. There are two different ways to treat chemical burns based on how the chemical, uh, based on the properties of the chemical. If it is a dry powdered chemical, we brush it off with a blood hand first, then we flush it. You don't want to activate the powdered chemical by adding water to it. If it's a liquid chemical, you immediately flush the area. Usually at least 20 minutes, you might see 15 to 20 minutes, but it, it's not like you're going to over flush it. You can just go ahead and, and flush the, uh, the area. If the chemical gets in the eye, usually you have those, uh, those eye wash, those eye baths. Um, the key if it gets in the eye is making sure that the, the eye that is affected, the water's running away from the good eye. So if this is the eye that is injured, I turn it down this way so it runs this way as opposed to turning it this way and running it into the eye that's not affected. Right? Same idea otherwise. Okay. Any questions on chemical burns? All right. Last of the burns deals with electrical burns. Okay. We never touch somebody that is still attached to a live electrical wire or anything that is causing the electric shock. If I go and put my hand on them or whatever body part for that matter, I'm gonna get a shock similar to them. That is not what we want. So make sure that the circuit has been turned off. And then we always look for anything that is immediately life-threatening. When we're dealing with electricity, usually that is something that is heart-related is our biggest concern. The heart short circuits, Somebody that is electrocuted, normally that is what causes the death, is the heart short circuiting. It doesn't work properly, it short circuits, and um, the heart simply doesn't function. Two entry sites, an entry and an exit wound, they may not match up. The entry wound a lot of time is in the hand, you reach out to grab something, and the exit wound may be the opposite shoulder or the bottom of the foot or whatever. Electricity takes the path of least resistance and it comes out somewhere. Right? Sometimes if there's some metal that's you know in the back pocket or something or in somewhere it may, may be attracted to that and may follow that out. But as a general rule, that's what we're looking at is it, it finds a path out and it follows that path. Okay? Again, that dry sterile dressing, electrical burns with cold water, basically the same care as for the thermal burns once the electrical um, source is you can also have damage to, you can also have damage, uh, broken bones, um, electricity passing through the body, and this is where the AED, um, CPR, things like that may come into play. Questions on birds? Okay, I'm gonna finish up with a couple of breathing emergencies. First one here we're gonna deal with is asthma. I realize this is the best illustration, but the idea of an asthma inhaler, when we're talking about medications and things like that, the ideal situation is that the victim themselves is able to administer the medication for themselves. Asthma inhalers are very, very easy to use. You shake them up, you simply press down on top, which is the actual uh, medication bottle, and it delivers a dose of the medication into the lungs. 
the good thing with asthma inhalers is it is basically impossible to overdose on asthma medication. If they get too much, all that's really gonna happen is the heart, or the breathing is gonna speed up a little bit and that will slow down on its own um, in a relatively short period of time. So if they need the medication, usually administering it should almost immediately make them feel better. Okay. So it relieves the swelling, it opens the airways. What that does is it allows for more uh, oxygen to be able to get into the lungs and it should improve their breathing um, very quickly. I put up here an example, this is what they call a spacer. So this is kind of what we talked about before, there's the inhaler. The example up here in this long tube is called a spacer. A lot of times young children will have spacers, also people that have exercised induced asthma will oftentimes have spacers. The asthma inhaler will work without the spacer. What the spacer does is instead of having you to bring it right up to the face, it allows it to mist in more and it allows it deeper into the lungs, but it will work without the spacer. We're not gonna spend a lot of time looking for a spacer if it's not there, okay? If they have it, great, they can use it. If not, it will work without the spacer, okay? And then this is what I kind of already talked about, the 15 minutes or the, uh, uh, five to 15 minutes, otherwise we get 911 further involved and then unresponsive or they're not showing any signs of being better in that night. Okay, last thing I have for uh, emergencies is the idea of anaphylaxis. This is your allergy shock, okay? There are any number of different things that can cause this. Some people have a peanut allergy, some people have allergies to latex, some people have uh, bee sting or, or uh, other um, insect allergies. You become very concerned in an anaphylaxis situation when the swelling moves up to the lips, the throat, the tongue starts to, starts to tingle or itch, the lips become numb, that's when you become more concerned, okay? Having a rash or hives on an arm or a leg is an allergic reaction but I'm not near as concerned about that as I am if the swelling of the lips and throat starts occurring, okay? Again, rapid heartbeat, uh, confusion, dizziness. If they have the EpiPen or the auto injector, that is what we traditionally like to use. I'll show you here an example. These are, these are the trained ones. This is what the EpiPens look like. You can kind of see it there as well. These are real easy to use. You simply remove the safety, it just goes right in the outside part of the thigh. You hold it in place. You're gonna notice they're saying here about three seconds now. Um, this varies. Some places will still tell you seven to 10 seconds. What they've kind of done is they've kind of come back on the amount of time that the EpiPen is in place. Because the idea is, is that in three to five seconds, you should have enough of the medication in the body to get the reaction that you are looking for to stop the reaction, okay? When it is injected, they need to be seated or lying down because what this is gonna do is it's gonna cause the heart to start racing very rapidly and if they are standing up, the blood pressure is gonna bottom out and they are going to collapse pretty quickly if they are not seated already, all right? Hopefully they have one of these, most people a lot of people that have um, anaphylactic reactions will carry EpiPens or auto injectors. Not everybody, but a lot of them will. The issue is if they don't have one or if it's a situation where they've never had an allergic reaction before and then suddenly come into, some, come into contact with something that they are allergic to. Okay. So here's what the medication actually does. It works to re re reduce those hives or reverse the hives and the swelling. Okay. It does wear off fairly quickly, about 10 to 20 minutes usually, and depending on how much of the allergen they've been exposed to, they may start to go through that anaphylactic shock again. <clears throat> EpiPens, auto injectors, um, this is a 911 situation. I would also, under almost any circumstance, not give more than one is ideal. They're probably only gonna have one anyway. Upward, sometimes you can give a second one. I would not give any more than two, 
because the, the problem with these are it will cause the heart to start beating very rapidly, which can cause that heart to stop and cause problems um, with, uh, with heart and uh, some of the things that go along with that. So then an AD, AD may end up being needed or CPR or whatever, remember, remember that. So the one, the EpiPens um, potentially are more dangerous um, with giving too much than would be the asthma needles. All right, questions? Something to add to that as well. Um, uh, university security in our medication base, we do carry the epinephrine. It's not the, it's not the auto injector, but we do carry the vials and the syringes. So our EMTs will be able to administer epinephrine to okay. somebody having a going into epinephrine junk. Okay. So that, that's a very uh, important point to know because if they don't have it, the quicker you get that activated and get them um, going, then stuff that can be injected. The uh, better off the person's chance of survival for sure, because that can be very fatal. It can be uh, fatal very quickly, I should say, if, if something is not done. If that throat closes up and they can't breathe, um, that can fairly quickly turn into something really, really significant. Any other questions or any questions from anybody else? What happens if the ambulance shows up? Sorry? What happens if the ambulance shows up? The student went down, we end up calling security, the ambulance shows up. Do they have to go in the ambulance? They don't have to. One of the big issues we run into is it costs money to go in the ambulance, right? And a lot of students in either insurance won't pay for it, may not have insurance, some combination thereof. And so they'll refuse that right to have a ride in the ambulance. Who's supposed to give that student a ride to the hospital? Thou shalt not. Yes. That the official rule book playbook says we do not transport friends, well, you don't transport you know, students, other faculty members, staff, things like that, just because of the liability of it. They need to contact family friends to come get them, cab, something like that. Does that suck? Especially you know the kid, you feel bad for the kid? Yeah. I like Mark, but I'm not going to risk my life driving across town when he's having a seizure to home the hospital. It is very risky to do that too because if something happens, think it's you and that person in the car and something happens in the car. What are you, what are you going to do? I mean, you're there with them alone. If something happens, you're, yeah, you put yourself in a lot of trouble. Two of these plus maybe two more that you can plow into the river. So. Right. I also think maybe of non traditional situations. Um, someone in a class starts having a panic attack. Uh, you know, things get blurry, rapid breathing, you think maybe it's an you know, asthma attack or something else might be going on, but it's really mental health related. Not a medical emergency, probably, um, but again, resources that are available on campus. Or if we talk about what the EMTs carry, they have Narcan. So that would be for an opioid overdose. Um, those are, those services are also available, and we have them in, the, in our pharmacy too, at Student Health Services for someone who has a frequent acquaintance who they may worry about. Um, Vaping has made the news lately with uh, lung disease or, or other kind of reactions to uh, e-cigarettes and jewels. So kind of a lot of these things go along with how you would respond in a medical emergency, but just maybe outside the, the playbook. The Narcan's a good one, I'm glad you brought that up. That was the one I was gonna add, and then I forgot at the very end. So yeah, the Narcan's a very, that's a very important one to add to. The student has a minor injury that probably needs some sort of care other than just a band-aid in the lab. What are their options and where to go? Has that been covered in anybody's discussions? Student health services doing normal business hours? So, yep, we are absolutely, we uh, prefer appointments, but we'll take walk-ins and we'll have people kind of coming in. Um, what gets a little tricky, I think, with student health services is if they're in pay status. Uh, so if they are an employee of the university, when an injury occurred, it's um, kind of a different process. It's called workers' comp then because the university uh, insurance needs to get involved. But if it's just an accident, uh, we have usually two physicians and two nurse practitioners on staff. We can do sutures, we can do dressing. Um, you know, somebody fell down skateboarding, going down Dalim. It has happened. Um, and they're just all road rashed up. Uh, you know, we can, we 
we can serve things like that. And then also to consider uh, the international student health insurance policy. So our international students on campus are required to purchase a health insurance policy and they actually get 100% coverage for illness and injury at Student Health Services. So if they are sick or they are hurt, it should be covered. There should be no bill for them to come to Student Health Services, whereas that's not the case if they were to go to the emergency department um, to a walk-in clinic in the community. That's certainly their choice. They're not required to use Student Health Services, but it's a nice option. What? Thanks for asking, Chandler. <laughs> uh, we're typically open during the school year. We're open every day that classes are in session. Uh, during the academic year, Monday through Friday, 8 to 4.30. Um, just a couple hours a week that we have in service. And then in the summer, uh, again, every day that classes are in session, 8 to 2. And outside of business hours, we have EMTs on staff. So they can kind of assess that situation, say, yeah, we need to call an ambulance, or you know what, health services opens. At 8 a.m. tomorrow, you could consider, depending on how you're feeling tomorrow morning, you consider calling them. That's uh, a good role name or something like that, where you know, probably not worthy of going to get an x-ray, but wake up in the morning and still sort of goes to student health services, and student health services doc say, yeah, that's a good one. Then off you go probably to x-ray. X-ray, sorry, we don't do x-rays on campus. Yeah, I was going to say, outside of student health services, where, where should we recommend they go? I mean, we have the hospital, but... Yep any of the urgent care yep and we have them listed on our website also either for after hours care or other options the bus system now takes students at no charge um, you know to pretty much any of the area clinics and hospitals yep most urgent care is open till eight seven it depends yeah if it's after eight o'clock you're probably going to have a yard visit that <coughs> rock is wednesday night class that theater class <laughs> intro film at nine o'clock and somebody's hurt you go to the yard. <laughs> the theater is dangerous. <laughs> yeah, I think, I think most of the urgent care is like 8 o'clock. That's kind of what I know. I, I know I had 8 o'clock before and then I think we're going to One of the things I share with faculty at USTAs and grad students that are helping teach, if you have an incident like that in one of your labs, the next morning, shoot me a quick email of, hey, this is what happened. Johnny, tech ID, 442111. This is the just the basics. And we try to log those. If we start seeing this, you know what? Every week in this one biology lab, we seem to have two or three kids go down. Guess whose lab we're going to go look at? <coughs> but if it's a onesie here, hey, you know, Susan grabbed a beaker and broke it, got glass in her hand. Be all right. if we start seeing that on a repetitive basis, we come to pay a visit. Any other questions for you guys? Anything else? Somebody in this room is going to have a finger. That happens all the time. This yeah. time of year is great. Nice yeah. warm fall. Maybe the spring is warm again. Especially so they need to look for a run before class. They need to breakfast. We're going to do a, a blood draw today. Right. That's yeah. Yeah, the fainting one is by far the one I see the most often. Even in the, the first aid classes that I teach, the, the fainting one is fairly regular. Anything else? All right. Thanks, Mark. Thanks. Thanks.